recipes, I should say. And now use generally just to describe the variety of life on Earth. Uh, we measure biodiversity in three different ways, through genetic diversity, species diversity, and habitat diversity. And each of them have a relationship with each other that we'll see how all that fits together. When we're looking at genetic diversity, we're looking at the range of genetic material present in a gene pool or in a population of species. And what we mean by the gene pool is the amount of different sections of DNA that are found in our cells in a specific population. So every type of gene that we have in each individual counts towards the gene pool. When we have a large gene pool, things are good. When we have a small gene pool, things are not so good. Um, and things like domestication and plant breeding specifically do limit our gene pool. So if we take a look at the picture that we have here in the lower left-hand corner, what we see is what corn used to look like, the wild types of corn versus what we have now. This becomes a problem, for instance, if we have a virus or we have a, um, a blight as what happens with the potatoes and the fa famine in Ireland, what happens is this comes in and destroys all of the different uh, potatoes because they all have the same types of genes. So what we have to do in order to conserve genetic biodiversity is to make sure that our populations don't have too similar of the genes. So I did mention the potato famine before, so if you take a look down here, this is what happened during the potato famine. So these, this is potatoes that are affected by blight. And this is what originally happened. The potato was a very important aspect in Ireland in their diet, but what they only used was one particular type of potato. And because potatoes are tubers, they are going to clone themselves. So you're, it's not going to be like you're going to get a seed from other things. It's just going to be the same runner that's going to come out of the potato and is going to produce more potatoes. So basically, they're cloned potatoes. They're all exactly identical. So down here, what we have are the susceptible potatoes. So up here, when we have a big diversity of potatoes, we only have a couple of them that are susceptible to this blight. So when we have the blight hit, when we have this type of fungus that comes in, if we have a very low diversity, we end up with no potatoes, versus if we have um, a variety of potatoes, we still have a couple to go on. Cheetahs are another thing that are very affected by genetic diversity right now. The genetic diversity is so low among cheetahs that they recently discovered that they can take skin grafts off of one cheetah and put it onto another cheetah and the new cheetah's body will not reject it. Generally, when we do transplants um, with skin grafts and even if you think about organs in humans, we have to take a lot of anti-rejection medicine so that bodies don't get rid of it and uh, force the immune system to act on itself. But in the case of the cheetahs, what they're finding out is that genetic diversity is so low that you can take skin from one and put it onto the other. Species diversity is the variety of species per unit area, and we look, of course, at just not just one area, but we look at the number of species and their abundance. And if you think back into topic two, you should recognize this as Simpson's diversity, and if not, probably should go back and take a look to review those kinds of things. Um, the higher the species diversity of the community, the greater complexity is in general. So areas of high species diversity are also likely to be undisturbed areas. And that brings us to habitat diversity, the range of different habitats or a number of ecological niches per unit area in an ecosystem community or a biome. This is the one that we generally want to save the most because if you have different amounts of diversity, then generally you have more species and you have more genes within that species. So this is the one that we usually like to focus on the most. Um, it's more likely to lead to an increase in the other two. Um, with our habitat diversity, remember that different biomes and different areas are going to have higher amounts of uh, diversity than others. For instance, our tropical rainforest typically has our highest amount of habitat diversity versus our tundra, which has our lowest amounts. So now we have to consider how we get all these different types of species anyway. And what we are going to look at is natural selection as the way that speciation occurs. Um, if you're taking IB Bio or you're taking other courses like biology, then you're probably going to go into a lot more detail than what's required by the IB, which is great. Um, but just remember that our requirements are not quite as depth and to genes and alleles and stuff like that. So for some of you, you may be happy about that and some of you won't be. Speciation is the gradual change in an organism's group population over time. 
And remember that we like to define species as a group of organisms that can interbreed and produce fertile offspring. So when we get to the point where we have two different organisms that are no longer able to interbreed and produce for um, fertile offsprings, then what we have is two separate species. So for instance, if we look at our classic example of donkeys and horses, they're two different species. They can mate and produce a fertile or produce an offspring, a mule, but because mules cannot repro reproduce themselves, they're not considered to be a separate species. So we have to look at what fertile offsprings mean too. And there's two different types that we generally look at, geographical or reproductive isolation. We do have to have a very short conversation about Darwin, just to kind of give us some background on this. And what he did was kind of piece together all of his evidence by all of his trips, particularly on the HMS Beagle. And his conclusions that he saw or the uh, trends that he noticed were that species tend to produce more offspring than can survive. So in the case, if you think about, you know, bugs, we've talked about K and R strategies before, but what we look at is they're going to produce hundreds of offspring at a time and only maybe a handful, 10 or so, may survive. Because there are more that are produced than can survive, this leads to competition within those groups. So what we also see as a result is that some of them are better able to compete than others, and those are the ones that are going to survive. And that brings us to the idea of natural selection. Individuals better suited to their environment survive and reproduce more successfully. And that's key there, that they're not only going to survive in their environment, but they're going to reproduce better than something that is not adapted to their environment. One thing to keep in mind with this idea of evolution and natural selection is that it is a change in the gene pool that individuals do not evolve. And a lot of these um, little comics that we're going to see come from um, Berkeley's Understanding Evolution website, and it's a good resource to so check that out. And so here's a polar bear without a fur coat, and he's wishing that he had a fur coat. It's not going to happen in that organism's lifetime. That polar bear is going to die and not survive because he doesn't have what he needs in order to survive in the environment. So individuals do not evolve, but the species, the change in the gene pool over time is what changes. So here's kind of another little graphic to show you this in a nutshell. Here we've got um, the crows that are going to eat the beetles, and they like green beetles better than any other beetles for some reason. So we start off with a whole mix of these brown and these green beetles. If they keep selecting the green beetles, over time we see an increase in the number of brown and a decrease in the number of green ones. And then finally, because the green beetles have been selected against, what we have are brown beetles. So now these crows have to make a decision. Do I start to, I shouldn't say decision, they have to react. Do they start eating the brown beetles, even though they're not as maybe they don't provide as many calories or provide as much taste as the other ones do, or do they die in return? This ties into the idea of fitness, which is how well an organism can survive and reproduce its environment. So if we take a look at those beetles again, maybe the reason that the green beetles are being selected rather than the brown beetles, because they live in an environment like this uh, flora of the forest. So there's lots of brown and not as much green. So the green beetles are going to stick out amongst the brown and therefore be eaten further. So they're not very fit for their environment. Fittest doesn't mean the strongest and the most able. Sometimes being the strongest does help you survive and reproduce, but not all the time. Fitness is how well the organism can survive and reproduce, not necessarily strength. So now that we know that natural selection leads to new species, what we have to look at is at the role of isolation in the development of new species. So isolation is a process where we have two populations that become separated by usually geographical or behavioral, um, genetic or reproductive factors. And once the gene flow is restricted between these two populations, a new species may evolve out of it. So here we have some isolation by geographic locations. So this is kind of what happens in a nutshell. What we have first is a population that's together. So here's my population of beetles once again. They're all together, they're mixed. And then a river starts to come between them. Things like rivers, mountains, um, canyons, something that divides the population. 
over time they develop differently because of different environmental factors on either side of this geographic barrier. So just like we mentioned the beetles before fitting into their environment in the forest floor, perhaps on this side of the river there was more green and this side there was more brown. So over time we have two populations and even if these populations have the opportunity to come and meet again, they won't interbreed. And we've seen this a few times, or many times, but the two times that we're going to talk about are, we have look at these types of spotted owls. There's two different types, there's Mexican and there's Northern. And they've become geographically separated over time, so now we have two varieties of them. Given enough time in these continued isolation, they are no longer going to be able to interbreed and produce fertile offspring, so therefore they will become two separate species. So because of probably all the development that we have going on in the corridor here between you know, Las Vegas and Los Angeles, and all of the um, development of communities that's happened, they've become separated from each other. This has also happened in the Grand Canyon. We have two different types of squirrels, one on the northern side and one on the southern side. And at one time, they were the same population, they were the same species, but after the Grand Canyon developed, we have two different squirrels on two different sides of the canyon. Another type that we have is reproductive isolation. So this is when um, the appearance or the behavior of population results in male and females no longer being attracted to each other or no longer being able to breed with each other. So for instance, up here we've got two birds that are going to make nests. So we've got a, um, they're boa birds found in Australia and New Guinea. And the male birds um, make elaborate um, nests out of area of things that they find like the shells and leaves, flowers, feathers, berries, and what they're doing is they're trying to attract the female. So our, we have our satin bowerbird that builds a channel between upright sticks, decorates them with these bright blue objects that you see there. But on the other side we have the McGregor bowerbirds that builds it out of sticks and uses charcoal to decorate it. So the females of the um, blue ones are not going to be attracted to the other ones, so therefore we have two different types of mating rituals that have developed, so they won't interbreed with each other. Another way that we have is if we take a look at these pictures here, what we see are different male parts of um, damselflies, and they all have a different type of shape to them, so females can only reproduce and mate with the appropriate male. So these two can no longer physically breed together because of changes in their reproductive organs. Another thing that could happen is a change of environment location. So if you take a look at these flies down here, there's different flies that like to reproduce in the mangoes versus one of the bananas. And if they have a preference of one over the other, the females of the bananas are never going to say, hey, I want to go over to the mango and meet that male. It's just not going to happen because they have two different um, rit rituals that are associated with it. The last thing that we do want to mention with reproductive isolation is that idea of offspring sterility that we mentioned before. So you can naturally have things like our mule over here, but then recently we have become very inventive with the process of putting together species so we get things like ligers, the lion, the tiger, and the zebra, and the horse, and the alpaca, and the camel. But all of these things, all these offsprings are sterile and they're usually not as strong and they usually don't last as long in terms of lifespan either.